Greetings. My name is David Meadows. I'm the artistic director of Circle in the Sand. I'm also one of the founding members of the International Actors Ensemble. Welcome to Richard II. This is the first part of our complete history cycle of the plays of William Shakespeare, which will be going through until the end of August, which will coincide with the second anniversary of these readings, which have been mostly analogue uh, live at the Alex Theatre in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I've been going for about 18 months. They're a co-production between Circle in the Sand, the International Actors Ensemble and the Alex Theatre. We have been doing the readings in full chronological order um, from the earliest plays that Shakespeare wrote to the last plays that he wrote. That's the idea at least. And uh, we've arrived at the history plays. Um, so far in the reading cycle, we've done The Two Gentlemen of Verona, The Taming of the Shrew, one pass through the, history, the um, Wars of the Roses plays the Henry Sixes and Richard III, Titus Andronicus, Edward III, uh, which he co-wrote with Thomas Kidd, The Comedy of Errors, which was our first experiment in bringing people in via webcam from overseas, uh, and subsequently Love's Labour's Lost, Romeo and Juliet, Midsummer Night's Dream, King John and the Merchant of Venice. Richard II is our 15th reading and our second one after The Merchant of Venice to be completely online. We have our biggest cast yet, 23 actors, six of whom are coming to us from other than Melbourne, Australia, where the rest of us are from. Um, and in fact, uh, those six actors are, and um, if they, perhaps these people want to put their screens up and wave um, while I introduce them from uh, Aaron T. Moore uh, is coming to us to read Thomas Mowbray, the Duke of Norfolk from Boise, Idaho. Um, Montgomery Sutton is coming to us from Queens, New York um, to read Henry Percy Hotspur. Jonathan Fuller is coming to us from Birmingham, Alabama to read um, Bolingbroke, um, who later becomes, spoiler alert, Henry IV. Um, we have uh, Valentina Vinci and Natalie Barron both joining us from London. And we have um, Carol Garay coming to us from Sao Paulo in Brazil. And we have three readings after this uh, cycle is over to finish off the year. Much Ado About Nothing, Julius Caesar and As You Like It. Next year, we're doing The Big Four Tragedies, Hamlet, Othello, King Lear and Macbeth, as well as some of the more obscure titles, Troilus and Cressida, Sir Thomas More, Timon of Athens. Um, want to encourage the sharing of this video anywhere you think people might be interested. Um, also want to encourage you to click on the GoFundMe link um, in, in the, the description. Um, it's particularly helpful for those of us in Australia because our government has aggressively voted against any financial support to us uh, during this uh, quarantine period. Um, so we're all suffering rather more than we would normally um, suffer. And my last item on the uh, live introduction script is get on with it. So uh, without any further ado, please enjoy the life and death of King Richard II. The Life and Death of King Richard II by William Shakespeare. Act 1, Scene 1. London, the palace of King Richard II of England. Enter King Richard II, John of Gaunt, nobles and attendants. O John of Gaunt, time-honoured Lancaster, hast thou, according to thy oath and bond, brought hither Henry Hereford, thy bold son, here to make good the boisterous late appeal which then our leisure would not let us hear against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? I have, my liege. Tell me, moreover, hast thou sounded him if he appealed the Duke on ancient malice, or worthily, as a good subject should, on some known ground of treachery in him? As near as I could sift him on that argument, on some apparent danger seen in him aimed at your highness, no inveterate malice. Then call them to our presence. Face to face and frowning brow to brow, ourselves will hear the accuser and the accused freely speak. High stomached are they both of, and full of ire. Enraged death as the sea, hasty as fire. Enter Henry Bolingbroke, the Duke of Hereford, and Sir Thomas Mowbray, the Duke of Norfolk. Many years of happy days before, my gracious sovereign and most loving liege. Each day still better others happiness until the heavens envying earth's good hap add an immortal title to your crown. We thank you both. 
Yet one but flatters us, as well appeareth by the cause you come, namely to appeal each other of high treason. Cousin of Hereford, what dost thou, what dost thou object against the Duke of Norfolk, Tom, Thomas Mowbray? First, having made the record of my speech, in devotion of a subject's love, tendering the precious safety of my prince, and free from other misbegotten hate, come I appellant to this princely presence. Now, Thomas Mowbray, do I turn to thee and mark my greeting well, for what I speak, my body shall make good upon the earth, or my divine soul answer it in heaven. Thou art a traitor and a miscreant, too good to be so and too bad to live, since the more fair and crystal is the sky, the uglier seem the clouds that in it fly. So once more and more with aggregate note, with a foul traitor's name, I stuff thy throat and wish, so please my sovereign, that I'm as I move, what my tongue speaks, my right arm should May my right arm's drawn sword may prove. Let not my cold words here accuse my zeal. It is not the trial of a woman's war, the bitter clamor of two eager tongues can arbitrate this cause betwixt us twain. The blood is hot that must be cooled for this. Yet can I not of such tame patience boast as to be hushed and not at all to say, First, the fair reverence of your highness curbs me from giving reins and spurs to my free speech, which else would post until it had returned these terms of treason doubled down his throat, setting aside his high blood's royalty and let him be no kinsman to my liege. I do define him and I spit at him. Call him a slanderous coward and a villain which to maintain I would allow him odds and meet him were I tied to run afoot even to the frozen ridges of the Alps or any other ground inhabitable wherever Englishmen durst set his foot. Meantime, let this defend my loyalty. By all my hopes, most falsely doth he lie. Yeah. Pale, trembling coward. Oh. Then I throw down my gauge, disclaiming here, the kindred of the king, and lay aside my high blood's royalty, which fear, not reverence, makes thee uh, to accept. If guilty dread have left in thee so much strength as to take up mine honor's pawn, then stoop, and by that all rights of knighthood else, will I make good against this arm to arm what I have spoke, or thou canst divine the worst. I take it up. And by that sword, I swear, which gently laid my knighthood on my shoulder, I'll answer thee in any fair degree or chivalrous design of knightly trial. And when I mount, alive may I not light, if I be traitor or unjustly fight. What doth our cousin lay to Mowbray's charge? It must be great that can inherit us so much as of, of a thought of ill in him. Look. What I speak, my life shall prove it true, that Marbury hath received 8,000 nobles in name and lendings of your highness's soldiers, the which he hath detained for lewd employments, like a false traitor and injurious villain. Besides, I say, and in will battle prove, or here, or elsewhere, or the furthest verge that ever surveyed by English eye, that all treasons, in these last 18 years, complotted and contrived in this land, fetch from false Marbury the first head and spring. Further, I say, and further will maintain upon this bad life to make all this good, that he did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death, suggest his soon believing adversaries, and consequently, like a traitor coward, sluiced out his innocent soul through streams of blood, which blood, like sacrificing Abel's, cries even from the tongueless caverns of the earth for me, for justice and rough chastisements. 
and by the glorious worth of my descent, my arm shall do it, or this life shall be spent. How high a pitch his resolution soars. Thomas of Norfolk, what sayest thou of this? Oh, let my sovereign turn away his face and bid his ears a little while be deaf till I have told this slander of his blood, how God and good men hate so foul a liar. <laughs> Mowbray, impartial are our eyes and ears. Were he my brother, nay, my kingdom's heir, as he is but my father's brother's son, now by my scepter's oar I make a vow. Such neighbor nearness to our sacred blood should nothing privilege him, nor partialize the unstooping firmness of my upright soul. He is our subject, Mowbray. So art thou, free speech and fearless, I to thee allow. Then Bolingbroke, as low as to thy heart through the false passage of thy throat, thou liest. Three parts of that receipt I had for callous dispersed I duly to his highness soldiers. The other part reserved I by consent for that my sovereign liege was in debt upon remainder of a dear account since last I went to France to fetch his queen. Now swallow down that lie. <laughs> for Gloucester's death, I slew him not but to my own disgrace neglected my sworn duty in that case. For you, my noble Lord of Lancaster, the honorable father to my foe, once did I lay an ambush for your life, a trespass that doth vex my grieved soul. But ere I last received the sacrament, I did confess it and exactly begged your grace's pardon, and I hope I had it. This is my fault. As for the rest appealed, it issues from the rancor of a villain, a recreant, a most degenerate traitor, which in myself I boldly will defend and interchangeably hurl down my gauge upon this overweening traitor's foot to prove, prove myself a loyal gentleman even in the best blood chambered in his bosom in haste whereof most heartily i pray your highness to assign our trial today wrath kindled gentlemen be ruled by me let's purge this collar without letting blood this we prescribe though no physician deep malice makes too deep incision forget forgive Conclude and be agreed. Our doctors say this is no month to bleed. Good uncle, let this end where it begun. We'll calm the Duke of Nor Norfolk, you, your son. To be and make peace shall become my age. Throw down my son, the Duke of Norfolk's gauge. And Norfolk, throw down his. When, Harry, when? Obedience bids I should not bid again. Norfolk, throw down, we bid. There is no boot. Myself, I throw dread sovereign at thy foot. My life thou shalt command, but not my shame. The one my duty owes, but my fair name, despite of death that lives upon my grave, to dark dishonor's use that shall not have. I am disgraced, impeached, and baffled here, pierced to the soul with slander's venomed spear, the which no balm can cure, but his heart blood, which breathed this poison. Rage must be withstood. Give me his gauge. Lions make leopards tame. Yeah, but not change his spots. Hmm. Take but my shame, and I resign my gauge, my dear, dear Lord, the purest treasure mortal times afford is spotless reputation. That away, men are but gilded loam or painted clay. A jewel in a 10 times bought up chest is a bold spirit in a loyal breast. Mine honor is my life, both grow in one, take honor from me, and my life is done. 
then dear my liege, mine honor let me try. In that I live, and for that will I die. Cousin, throw up your gauge. Do you begin? Oh, God defend my soul on such a deep sin. Shall I seem crestfallen in my father's sight? Or pale with beggar fear, and impeach my height before this outdared dastard? Ere my tongue shall wound my honor with such feeble wrong, or sound such base appall, my teeth shall tear the slavish motive of recanting fear and spit it bleeding in high disgrace where shame doth harbor in in Mowbray's face. We were not born to sue, but to command, which since we cannot do to make you friends, be ready as your life shall answer it at Coventry, upon St. Lambert's day. There shall your short swords and lances arbitrate the swelling difference of your settled hate. Since we cannot atone you, we shall see justice design the victor's chivalry. Lord Marshal, command our officers at arms, be ready to di direct these home alarms. They all exit. Act one, scene two, the palace of John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster. Enter John of Gaunt and the Duchess of Gloucester. Alas. The part I had in Woodstock's blood, that more solicit me than your exclaims to stir against the butchers of his life. But since correction lieth in those hands which made the fault that we cannot correct, put we our quarrel to the will of heaven, who, when they see the hours ripe on earth, will rain hot vengeance on offenders' heads. Mine's brotherhood in thee no sharper spur. Have love in thy old blood no living fire. Edward's seven sons, whereof thyself art one, were as seven vials of his sacred blood, or seven fair branches springing from one root. Some of those seven are dried by nature's course. Some of those, those branches by destiny's cut. But Thomas, my dear Lord, my life, my Gloucester, one vile fall of Edward's sacred blood, one flourishing branch of his most royal root is cracked and all the precious liquor spilt is hacked down and his summer's leaves all faded by envy's hand and murder's bloody axe. Oh, God, his blood was thine that bed, that womb, that metal, that self-mould that fashioned thee, made him a man. And though thou livest and breathest, yet art thou slain in him. Thou dost consent in some large measure to thy father's death, in that thou seest thy wretched brother die, who was the model of thy father's life. Call it not patience, God, it is despair. In suffering thus thy brother to be slaughtered, thou showest the naked pathway to thy life, it's teaching stern murder how to butcher thee. That which in mean men we entitle patience is pale, cold cowardice in noble breasts. What shall I say? To safeguard thine own life, the best way is to venge my Gloucester's death. God's is the quarrel. For God's substitute, his deputy anointed in his sight, has caused his death, the which wrongfully let heaven revenge. For I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. Where then? Alas, may I complain myself? To God, the widow's champion and defence. Why then I will. Farewell, old Gaunt. Thou goest to Coventry, there to behold our cousin Hereford and fell Mowbray fight. Oh, sit my husband's wrongs on Hereford's spear, that they may enter Mowbray's breast, or if misfortune miss the first career, be Mowbray's sin so heavy on his bosom, that they may break his foaming courses back and throw the rider headlong in the lists, a caitiff recreant to my cousin Hereford. Farewell, old Gaunt, thy sometimes brother's wife, with her companion grief must end her life. Sister, 
farewell. I must to Coventry. As much good stay with thee as go with me. And yet one word more. Grief boundeth where it falls, not with empty hollowness, but wait. I take my leave before I have begun, for sorrow ends not when it seemeth done. Commend me to thy brother, Edmund York. Lo, this is all. Nay, yet depart not so. Though this be all, do not so quickly go. I, I, I shall remember more. Bid him, oh, what? With all good speed at Plashy visit me. Alack, and what shall good old York see there? But empty lodgings and unfurnished walls and unpeopled offices, untrodden stones. And what here there for welcome but my groans? Therefore commend me. Let him not come there to seek out sorrow that dwells everywhere. Desolate, desolate will I hence and die. The last leave of thee takes my weeping eye. They both exit. Act one, scene three, the lists at Coventry. Enter the Lord Marshal and the Duke of O'Merle. Yea, at all points, and longs to enter in. The Duke of Norfolk's gratefully and mockingly stands at the summons of the Captain's trumpet. Why then, the champions are prepared and stay for nothing but His Majesty's approach. Enter King Richard, with nobles and officers, including John of Gaunt. When they are set, enter Thomas Mowbray, in arms, defendant, with a herald. Marshal, demand of yonder champion the cause of his arrival here in arms. Ask him his name, and orderly proceed to sway him in the justice of his cause. In God's name and the King's, say who thou art, and why thou comest thus knightly clad in arms. Against what man thou hast come, and what thy quarrel? Speak truly on thy knighthood and thy oath, as so defend thee heaven and thy valour. My name is Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, who hither come engaged by my oath, which God defend a knight should violate, both to defend my loyalty and truth to God, my king, and my succeeding issue against the Duke of Hereford that appeals me, and by the grace of God, and this, mine arm, to prove him in defending of myself a traitor to my God, my King, and me. And as I truly fight, defend me, heaven. Enter Henry Bolingbroke, appellant, in armour, with a second herald. Marshal, ask yonder knight in arms, born who he is, and why he cometh hither, thus plated in habiliments of war, and formally, according to our law, depose him in the justice of his cause. What is thy name, and wherefore comest thou hither, before King Richard and his royal lists? Against whom comest thou, and what's thy quarrel? Speak like a true knight, so defend the heaven. Hattie of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby am I, who ready here do stand in arms to prove, by God's grace and my body's valour, in lists on Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, that he is a traitor, foul and dangerous, to God's heaven, King Richard, and to me. And as I truly fight, defend me heaven. On pain of death, no person be so bold or daring hardy. <laughs> and 
as to touch the lists, except the marshal and such officers appointed to direct these fair designs. Lord Marshal, let me kiss my sovereign's hand and bow my knee before his majesty. For Mowbray and myself are like two men that vowed a long and weary pilgrimage. Then let us take a ceremonious leave and loving farewell of our several friends. The appellant in all duty greets your highness and craves to kiss your hand and take his leave. We will descend and fold him in our arms. He descends the dais and embraces Bolingbroke. Cousin of Hereford, as thy cause is right, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood, which if today thou shed, lament we may but not revenge thee dead. Oh, let no noble eye profane a tear for me if I be gored by Mulberry's spear. As confident as a falcon's flight against a bird do I with Mulberry fight. My loving lord, I take my leave of you, of you, my noble cousin, Lord Almerle, not sick, although I have to do with death, but lusty young and cheerily drawing breath. And lo, as England feasts, so I salute the daintiest last to make the end most sweet. O oh, thou, the earthly author of my blood, whose youthful spirit in me regenerate doth with a twofold vigor, lift me up and reach at victory above my head to add proof unto mine armor with thy prayers. And with my blessings, steel, and Lance's point that it may enter Mowbray's waxen coat and furbish new the name of John Agont, even in the lusty behavior of his son. God in thy good cause make thee prosperous. Be swift like lightning in the execution, and let thy blows doubly redoubled fall like amazing thunder on the cask of thy adverse pernicious enemy. Rouse up thy youthful blood. Be valiant and live. Mine innocence in St. George to thrive. However God of fortune may cast my lot, there lives or dies. True to King Richard's throne, a loyal, just, and upright gentleman. Never did captive with a freer heart cast off his chains of bondage and embrace his golden, uncontrolled enfranchisement more than my dancing soul doth celebrate this feast of battle with mine adversary, most mighty liege, and my companion peers. Take from my mouth the wish of happy years, as gentle and as jocund as to jest, Jesus. why to fight? Truth hath a quiet breast. Farewell, my lord. Securely I espy virtue with valor cultured in thine eye. Order the trial, marshal, and begin. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, receive thy lance, and God defend the right. Strong as a tower, I hope, and cry amen. Go bear this lance to Thomas, Duke of Norfolk. Harry of Harford, Lancaster, and Derby stands here for God, his sovereign, and himself on pain to be found false and recreant. To prove the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray, a traitor to his God, his king, and him, and dares him to set forward to the fight. Here standeth Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, on pain to be found false and recreant both to defend himself and to approve Henry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby to God, his sovereign, and to him disloyal, courageously and with a free desire, attending but the signal to begin. Sound trumpets and set forward competent. Stay, the king hath thrown his warder down. Let them lay by their helmets and their spears and both return back to their chairs again. Withdraw with us and let the trumpet sound 
while we return these dukes what we decree. King Richard consults with Gaunt and other nobles. Trumpets sound for a long time. King Richard addresses Bolingbroke and Mowbray. Draw near and list what with our council we have done. For that our kingdom's earth should not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered, and for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds plowed up with neighbor's sword. And for we think the winged, the eagle winged pride of sky aspiring and ambitious thoughts with rival hating envy set on you to wake our peace, which in our country's cradle draws the sweet infant breath of gentle sleep, which so roused up with boisterous untuned drums, with harsh resounding trumpets, dreadful bray, and grating shock of wrathful iron arms, might from our quiet confines fright fair peace and make us wade even in our kindred's blood. Therefore, we banish you our territories. You, cousin Hereford, upon pain of life, till twice five summers have enriched our fields, shall not regreet our fair dominions, but tread the stranger paths of banishment. Your will be done. This my comfort must be. The sun that warms you here shall shine on me, and those his golden beams to you that here lent shall point on me and gild my banishment. Norfolk, for thee remains a heavier doom, which I with some unwillingness pronounce. The sly, slow hours shall not determinate the dateless limit of thy dear exile. The hopeless word of never to return breathe I against thee upon pain of life. A heavy sentence, my most sovereign liege, and all unlooked for from your highness' mouth. A dearer merit, not so deep a maim as to be cast forth in the common air, have I deserved at your highness' hands. The language I have learnt these forty years, my native English, now I must forego, and now my tongue's use is to me no more than an unstringed viol or, or a harp or like a cunning instrument cased up, or being open put into his hands that knows no touch to tune the harmony within my mouth. You have enjailed my tongue, doubly portcullised with my teeth and lips, and dull, unfeeling, barren ignorance is made my jailer to attend on me. I am too old to fawn upon a nurse, too far in years to be a pupil now. What is thy sentence then but speechless death? which robs my tongue from breathing native breath. It boots thee not to be compassionate. After our sentence, plaining comes too late. Then thus I turn me from my country's light to dwell in solemn shades of endless night. He makes to exit. Return again and take an oath with thee. Lay on our royal swords with your banished hands. Swear by the duty that you owe to God, our part therein we banish with yourselves, to keep the oath that we administer. You never shall, so help you truth and God, embrace each other's love in banishment. You never look upon each other's face, nor never write, regret, nor reconcile this lowering tempest of your homebred hate nor never by advised purpose meet to plot, contrive, or complot any ill against us, our state, our subjects, and our land. I swear. And I, to keep all this. Norfolk, as far as to mine enemy by this time, had the king permitted us, 
One of our souls would have been wandering the air, banished this frail sepulcher of our flesh, and now our flesh is banished from this land. Confess thy treasons ere thou fly the realm. Since thou hast far to go, bear not along the chogging burden of a guilty soul. No, Bolingbroke. If ever I were a traitor, my name be blotted from the book of life, and I from heaven banished as from hence. But what thou art, God, thou, and I do know. And all too soon, I fear the king shall rue. Farewell, my liege. Now no way can I stray save back to England, all the world's my way. Mowbray exits. Uncle, even in the glasses of thine eyes, I see thy grieved heart. Thy sad aspect hath from the number of his banished years plucked four away. Six frozen winters spent, return with welcome home, from banishment. A longer time lies in one little word. Four lagging winters and four wanton springs end in a word. Such is the breath of kings. I thank my liege that in regard of me he shortens four years of my son's exile. But little vantage shall I reap thereby. For ere the six years that he hath to spend can change their moons and bring their times about, my oil-dried lamp and time-bewasted light shall be extinct with age and endless night. My inch of taper will be burnt and done, and blindfold death not let me see my son. Why, uncle, thou hast many years to live. But not a minute, king, that thou canst give. Shorten my days, thou canst with sullen sorrow, and pluck nights from me, but not lend a morrow. Thou canst help time to furrow me with age, but stop no wrinkles in his pilgrimage. Thy word is current with him for my death, but dead, thy kingdom cannot buy my breath. Thy son is banished upon good advice, whereto thy tongue a party verdict gave. Why at our justice seems thou then to lower? Things sweet to taste prove in digestion sour. You urged me as a judge, but I had rather you would have bid me argue like a father. Oh, had it been a stranger, not my child, to smooth his fault, I should have been more mild. A partial slander sought I to avoid, and in the sentence my own life destroyed. Alas, I looked when some of you should say I was too strict to make mine own away. But you gave leave to my unwilling tongue, against my will, to do myself this wrong. Cousin, farewell, and uncle, bid him so. Six years we banish him, and he shall go. Exit King Richard and his train. Cousin, farewell. What presence must not know, from where you do remain, let paper show. My lord, no leave take I, for I will ride as far as land will let me by your side. Oh, to what purpose dost thou hoard thy words, that thou returnest no greeting to thy friends? I have too few to take my leave of you. When the tongue's office should be prodigal, to breathe the abundant dollar of the heart. Thy grief is but thy absence for a time. Joy absent, grief is present for that time. What is six winters? They are quickly gone. To men in joy, but grief makes ten hours, one hour ten. 
call it a travel that thou takest for pleasure. My heart will sigh when I miscall it so, which finds it an enforced pilgrimage. The sullen passage of thy weary steps esteem as foil wherein thou art to set the precious jewel of thy home return. Nay, rather every tedious stride I make will but remember me. What a deal of world I wander from the jewels that I love. Must I not serve a long apprenticehood to foreign passages? And in the end, having my freedom, boast of nothing else but that I was a journeyman to grief? All places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man ports and happy havens. Teach thy necessity to reason thus. There is no virtue like necessity. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. Woe doth the heavier sit where it perceives it is but faintly born. Go, oh, say I sent thee forth to purchase honor and not the king exiled thee. Or suppose devouring pestilence hangs in our air and thou art flying to a fresher clime. Look, what thy soul holds dear, imagine it to lie that way thou goest, not whence thou comest. Suppose the singing birds, musicians, the grass whereon thou treadst, the presents strewed, the flowers, fair ladies, and thy steps no more than a delightful measure or a dance. For gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks at it and set it light. Oh, who, who can hold a fire in his hand by thinking of the frosty caucuses? Or cloy the hungry edge of appetite of, by bare imagination of a feast? Or wallow naked in December snow by thinking on fantastic summer's heat? Oh, no. The apprehension of the good gives but the greater feeling to the worst. Pale sorrow's tooth doth never rankle make more than when he bites and lanceth not the sore. Come, come, my son, I'll bring thee on thy way. Had I thy youth and cause, I would not stay. Then, <laughs> England's ground, farewell. Sweet soil adieu. My mother and my nurse that bears me yet. Where'er I wander, most of this I can, though banished, yet a true born Englishman. They all exit. Act one, scene four. The court. Enter King Richard with Bagot and Green at one door, the Duke of O'Merl at another. We did observe, cousin O'Merl. How far brought you High Hereford on his way? I brought High Hereford, if you call him so, but to the next highway, and there I left him. And say, what store of parting tears were shed? Faith, none, for me except the northeast wind, which then blew bitterly against our faces, awakes the sleeping room, and so by chance did grace our hollow parting with a tear. What said our cousin when you parted with him? Farewell. And for my heart disdained that my tongue should so profane the word that taught me craft to counterfeit oppression with such grief that words seem buried in my sorrow's grave. Marry would the word farewell have a lengthened hours and added years to his short banishment. He should have had a volume of farewells, but since it would not, he had none of me. He is our cousin, cousin. But tis doubt when time shall call him home from banishment, whether our kinsmen come to see his friends. Ourself and Bushy, Bagot here and Green, observed his courtship to the common people, how he did seem to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy. What reverence he did throw away on slaves, wooing poor craftsmen, with the craft of smiles and patient underbearing of his fortune, as twere to banish their effects with him. Off goes his bonnet to an oyster wench, 
a brace of draymen bid God speed him well and had the tribute of his supple knee with thanks, my countrymen, my loving friends, as were our England in reversion his, and he our subjects next hope in next degree in hope. Well, he is gone, and with him go these thoughts. Now, for the rebels which stand in Ireland, expedient manage must be made, my liege, ere further leisure yield them further means for their advantage and your highness loss. We will ourself in person to this war, and for our coffers with too great a court and liberal largesse are grown somewhat light, we are enforced to farm our royal realm, the revenue whereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand, if that comes short, our substitutes at home shall have blank charters, whereto when they shall know what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold and send them after to supply our wants. For we will make for Ireland presently. Enter Bushy. Bushy, what news? Old John of Gaunt is grievous sick, my lord suddenly taken and hath sent post haste to entreat your majesty to visit him where lies he at Eli's house now put it god in the physician's hand to help him to his grave immediately the lining of his coffers shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these irish wars come gentlemen let's go visit him pray god we make haste and come too late Amen. Amen. They exit. Act 2, Scene 1. Eli House. Enter John of Gaunt, sick, with the Duke of York and attendants. Will the King come, that I may breathe my last in wholesome counsel to his unstayed youth? Vex not yourself, nor strive not with your breath. For all in vain comes counsel to his ear. Oh, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. Where words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain. For they breathe truth that breathe their words in pain. He that no more must say is listened more than they whom youth and ease have taught to close. More are men's ends marked than their lives before, the setting sun and music at the close, as the last taste of sweets is sweetest last, written remembrance more than things long past. Though Richard my life's counsel would not hear, my death's sad tale may yet undeaf his ear. No, it is stopped with other flattering sounds, as praises of whom Taste the wise are fond, the lascivious meters to whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen. Report of fashions in proud Italy, whose manners still our tardy apish nation limps after in base imitation. Where doth the world thrust forth a vanity? So it be new there's no respect how vile, but is not quickly buzzed into his ears. Then all too late comes counsel to be heard where will doth mutiny with wits regard. Direct not him whose way himself will choose. Tis breath thou lackst, and that breath wilt thou lose. Methinks I am a prophet new inspired, and thus expiring do foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. Small showers last long, but sudden storms are short. He tires betimes that spurs too fast betimes, with eager feeding food doth choke the feeder. Light, vanity, and satient cormorant consuming means soon preys upon itself. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, the seat of Mars. This other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress 
built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre and stubborn jury of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out by thy pronouncing it, like to a tenement or pelting farm. England, bound in with the triumphant sea, whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Ah, would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were my ensuing death. The king is come. Enter King Richard and Queen, Duke of O'Merle, Bushy, Bagot, Green, Lord Ross, and Lord Willoughby. The king is come. Deal mildly with his youth, for young hot colts being raged do rage the more. How fares our noble uncle Lancaster? What comfort, man? How is it with aged gaunt? Oh, how that name befits my composition. Old gaunt indeed, <laughs> and gaunt in being old. Within me grief hath kept a tedious fast, and who abstains from meat that is not gaunt? For sleeping England long time have I watched, watching breeds leanness, leanness is all gaunt. The pleasure that some fathers feed upon is my strict fast. I mean my children's looks, and therein fasting hast thou made me gaunt. Gaunt am I for the grave, gaunt as a grave, whose hollow womb inherits naught but bones. Can sick men play so nicely with their names? No, misery makes sport to mock itself. Since thou dost seek to kill my name in me, I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. Should dying men flatter with those that live? No, no, men living flatter those that die. Thou, now a dying, sayest thou flatterest me. Oh, no, thou diest, though I the sicker be. I am in health, I breathe and see thee ill. Now, he that made me know I see thee ill, ill in myself to see, and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land, wherein thou liest in reputation sick, and thou, too careless patient as thou art, commits thy anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown, whose compass is no bigger than thy head, and yet, encaged in so small a verge, the waste is no whit lesser than thy land. Oh, had thy grandsire with a prophet's eye seen how his son's son should destroy his sons, from forth thy reach he would have laid thy shame, deposing thee before thou wert possessed, which art possessed now to depose thyself. Why, cousin, wert thou regent of the world? 
It were a shame to let this land by lease. But for thy world, enjoying but this land, is it not more than shame to shame it so? Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bond slave to the law, and thou... A lunatic, lean-witted fool, presuming on an ague's privilege, dare us with thy frozen admonition, make pale thou cheek, chasing the royal blood with fury from his native residence. Now, by my seat's right royal majesty, wert thou not brother to great Edward's son, this tongue that runs so roundly in thy head shall, should run thy head from thy unreverent shoulders. Oh, spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father Edward's son, that blood already, like the pelican, hast thou tapped out and drunkenly caroused. My brother Gloucester, plain, well-meaning soul, whom fair befall in heaven amongst happy souls, may be a precedent and witness good that thou respects not spilling Edward's blood. Join with the present sickness that I have, Thy unkindness be like crooked age, to crop at once a too long withered flower. Live in thy shame, but die not shame with thee. These words hereafter thy tormentors be. Convey me to my bed, then to my grave. Love they to live that love and honour have. He exits, borne off by his attendants. And let them that die, that age and sullens have, for both hast thou, and both become the grave. I do beseech your majesty, impute his words to wayward sickliness and age in him. He loves you on my life and holds you dear as Harry, Duke of Hereford, were he here. Right. You say true. As Hereford's love, so his. As theirs, so mine. And all be as it is. Enter Northumberland. My liege, old Gaunt commends him to your majesty. What says he? Nay, nothing. All is said. His tongue is now a stringless instrument. Words, life, and all old Lancaster hath spent. New York, the nest next that must be bankrupt so. Though death be poor, it ends a mortal woe. The ripest fruit first falls, and so doth he. His time is spent, our pig pilgrimage must be. So much for that. Now, for our Irish wars, we must supplant those rough, rug-headed kern, which live like venom, where no venom else but only they have privilege to live. And for these great affairs do ask some charge. Towards our assistance, we do seize to us the plate, coin, revenues, and movables, whereof our Uncle Gaunt did stand possessed. How long shall I be patient? Oh, how long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong? Not Gloucester's death, nor Hereford's banishment, nor Gaunt's rebukes, nor England's private wrongs, nor the prevention of poor Bolingbroke about his marriage, nor my own disgrace have ever made me sour my patient cheek or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. I am the last of Edward's noble sons of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first. In war was never lion rage more fierce. In peace was never gentle lamb more mild than was that young and princely gentleman. His face thou hast, for even so looked he accomplished with the number of thy hours. But when he frowned, it was against the French and not against his friends. His noble hand did win what he did spend and spent not that which his triumphant father's hand had won. His hands were guilty of no kindred blood, but bloody with the enemies of his kin. Oh, Richard, York is 
too far gone with grief or else he never would compare between. Why, uncle, what's the matter? Oh, my liege, pardon me if you please. If not, I please not to be pardoned and content with all. Seek you to seize and gripe into your hands the royalties and rights of banished Hereford. Is not Gaunt dead? And doth not Hereford live? Was not Gaunt just and is not Harry true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir? Is not his heir a well-deserving son? Take Hereford's rights away and take from time his charters and his customary rights. Let not tomorrow then ensue today. Be not thyself, for how art thou a king but by fair sequence and succession? Now afore God, God forbid I say true, if you do wrongfully seize Hereford's rights, call in the letters patents that he hath by his eternal attorney generals to sue his livery and deny his offer homage, you pluck a thousand dangers on your head, you lose a thousand well-disposed hearts and prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honor and allegiance cannot think. Think you what you will. We seize into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his lands. I'll not be by the while. My liege, farewell. What will ensue hereof, there's none can tell. But by bad courses may be understood that their events can never fall out good. The Duke of York exits. Go, Bushy to the Earl of Wiltshire Strait. Bid him repair to us to Eli House to see this business. Tomorrow next we will for Ireland and tis time I trow. And we will create in absence of ourselves, our uncle York, Lord Governor of England, for he is just and always loved us well. <sighs> Come on, our queen. Tomorrow must we part. Be merry. For our time of stay is short. Exit all but Northumberland, Willoughby, and Ross. Well, lords, the Duke of Lancaster is dead. And living too, uh, for now his son is Duke. Barely in title, not in revenues. Richly in both, if justice had a right. My heart is great, but it must break with silence ere it be disburdened with a liberal tongue. Nay, speak thy mind, and let him ne'er speak more that speaks thy words again to do thee harm. Tens that thou wouldst speak to the Duke of Hereford, if it be so, out with a boldly man, quick as my near to hear of good towards him. <laughs> no good at all that I can do for him, unless you call it good to pity him, bereft and gelded of his patrimony. Now, afore God, tis shame such wrongs are born in him a royal prince, and many more of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself, but basely led by flatterers. And what they will inform merely in hate against any of us all, that will the king severely prosecute against us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. Well, the commons hath he pilled with grievous taxes, and quite lost their hearts. The nobles hath he fined for ancient quarrels, and quite lost their hearts. And daily new exactions are devised as blanks, benevolences, and I what not what, but what in oh God's name doth become of this? Wars have not wasted it, for ward he hath not, but basely yielded upon compromise that which his noble ancestors achieved with blows. More hath he spent in peace than they in wars. The Earl of Wiltshire hath the realm in farm. The king grown bankrupt like a broken man. Reproach and dissolution hangeth over him. Oh, he hath not money for these Irish wars, his burdenous taxations notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke. His noble kinsman, most degenerate king. But lords, 
We hear this fearful tempest sing, yet see no shelter to avoid the storm. We see the wind sit sore upon our sails, and yet we strike not, but securely perish. We see the very wreck that we must suffer, and unavoided is the danger now for suffering, so the causes of our wrecks. Not so. Even through the hollow eyes of death, I spy life peering. But I dare not say how near the tiding of our comfort is. Nay, let us share thy thoughts as thou dost ours. Oh, be confident to speak, Northumberland. Uh, we three are but thyself, and speaking so, thy words are but as thoughts. <laughs> Therefore be bold. Then thus. I have, from Port Le Blanc, a bay in Brittany, received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, Reynold, Lord Cobham, that late broke with from the Duke of Exeter, his brother, Archbishop late of Canterbury, Sir Thomas Erpingham, Sir, Tom, Sir John Ramston, Sir John Norbury, Sir Robert Waterton, and Francis Coynt, all these well furnished by the Duke of Bretagne, with eight tall ships, 3,000 men of war, are making hither with all due expedience and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. Perhaps they had ere this, but that they stay the first departing of the king for Ireland. If then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, imp out our drooping country's broken wing, redeem from broken pawn the blemished crown, wipe off the dust that hides our scepter's guilt, and make high majesty look like itself. Away with me in post to Ravenspurg. But if you faint in fearing to do so, stay and be secret, and myself will go. To horse, to horse, urge doubt to them that fear. Hold out my horse, and I will be first there. They exit. Act two, scene two, the palace. Enter Richard's queen, Bushy, and Baggett. Madam, your majesty's too much said. You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside life, harm, and heaviness and entertain a cheerful disposition. To please the king, I did. To please myself, I cannot do it. Yet, I know no cause why I should welcome such a guest as grief, save bidding farewell to so sweet a guest as my sweet Richard. Yet again, methinks some unborn sorrow riping my fortune's warmth is coming towards me, and my inward soul with nothing trembles. At something it grieves more than with parting from my lord, the king. Each substance of a grief hath twenty shadows, which shows like grief itself, but it is not so. For sorrow's eyes, glazed with blinding tears, divides one thing entire to many objects, like perspectives which rightly gazed upon, show nothing but confusion, eyed or distinguished form. So your sweet majesty, looking awry upon your lord's departure, find shapes of griefs more than himself to wail, which looked on as it is, is not but shadows of what it is not. Then thrice gracious queen, more than your lord's departure weep not. More is not seen, or if it be, it is false sorrow's eyes, which for things true weeps things imaginary. It may be so, but yet my inward soul persuades me it is otherwise. However it be, I cannot but be sad. So heavy sad as thought on thinking, on no thought I think, makes me with heavy nothing faint and shrink. Tis nothing but conceit, my gracious lady. Tis nothing less. Conceit is still derive it from some forefather grief. Mine is not so, for something had begot my, 
my something grief or something had the nothing that I grieve. This in reversion that I do possess. But what is it is that is not yet known? What I cannot name. This nameless all I want. Enter green. God save your majesty and well met, gentlemen. I hope the king is not yet shipped for Ireland. Why hopest thou so? This better hope he is, for he designs grave haste, his haste good hope. Then wherefore dost thou hope he's not shipped? That he, our hope, might have retired his power and driven into despair an enemy's hope, who strongly hath set footing in this land. The banished Bolingbroke repeals himself and with uplifted arms is safe arrived at Ravenspurg. Now, God in heaven forbid. Now, madam, it is too true. And what is worse, the Lord Northumberland, his young son, Harry Percy, the lords of Ross, Beaumont and Willoughby, with all their powerful friends, are fled to him. Why have you not proclaimed Northumberland and all the rest revolted faction traitors? We have, whereupon the Earl of Worcester hath broke his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all the household servants fled with him to Bolingbroke. So bring... Thou art the midwife to my own, and Bolingbroke my sorrows dismay or air. Now had my soul brought forth her prodigy, and I, a gasping new delivered mother, have all to all sorrow to sorrow joined. Despair not, madam. Who shall hinder me? I will despair and be at enmity with causing hope. He's a flatterer. A parasite, a keeper back of dead, who gently will dissolve the bands of life which false hope lingers in extremity. Here comes the Duke of York. With signs of war about his age and neck. Oh, full of careful business are his looks. Uncle, for God's sakes, speak comfortable words. Should I do so, I should belie my thoughts. Comfort's in heaven, and we are on the earth, where nothing lives but crosses, cares, and grief. Your husband, he is gone to save far off, whilst others come to make him lose at home. Here am I left to under Proppy's land, who, weak with age, cannot support myself. Now comes the sick hour that his surfeit made. Now shall he try his friends that flatter him. Enter a servant. My lord, your son was gone before I came. He was. Why? So, go all which way it will. The nobles, they are fled, the commons, they are cold, and will, I fear, revolt on Hereford's side. Sirrah, get thee to Plashy, to my sister Gloucester. Did her send me presently a thousand pound? Hold, here, take my ring. My lord, I had forgot to tell your lordship. Today, as I came by, I call it there. But I shall grieve you to report the rest. What is it, knave? An hour before I came, the Duchess died. God, for his mercy, what a tide of woes come rushing on this woeful land at once. I know not what to do. I would to God, sir, my untruth had not provoked him to it. The king had cut off my head with my brothers. What, are there no posts dispatched for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister, cousin, I would say, pray, pardon me. Go, fellow, get thee home, provide some carts, and bring away the armor that is there. The servant exits. <sighs> Gentlemen, will you go muster men? If I know how or why or which way to order these affairs thus thrust disorderly into my hands, never believe me. Both are my kinsmen. To one is my sovereign, whom both my oath and duty bids defend. The other again is my kinsman, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Well, somewhat we must do. Come, cousin, I'll dispose of you. Gentlemen, Go muster up your men and meet me presently at Berkeley. 
I should to Plashy too, but time will not permit. All is uneven, and everything is left at six and seven. Exit Duke of York and Queen. The wind sits fair for news to go to Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportionable to the enemy, it's all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those love not the king. Right, and that's the wavering commons for their love. Lies in their purses and whose empties them by so much fills their hearts with deadly hate. Wherein the king stands generally condemned. Yeah, if judgment lie in them, then so do we, because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Thither will I with you, for little office the hateful commons will perform for us, except like curse to tear us all to pieces. Will you go along with us? No, I will to Ireland to his majesty. Farewell. If heart's presages be not vain, we three hear art that ne'er shall meet again. That's as York thrives to beat back Bolingbroke. Alas, poor Duke, the task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry, where one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Farewell at once, for once and for all and ever. Well, we may meet again. I fear me never. They all exit. Act two, scene three. Wilds in Gloucestershire. Enter Henry Bolingbroke and Northumberland leading an army. How far is it, my lord, to Barclay now? Believe me, noble lord, I am a stranger here in Gloucestershire. These high wild hills and rough uneven ways draw out our miles and makes them wearisome. And yet your fair discourse hath been as sugar making the hard way sweet and delectable. But I bethink me what a weary way from Ravensburg to Cotswold will be found in Ross and Willoughby, wanting your company, which, I protest, hath very much beguiled the tediousness and process of my travel. But theirs is sweetened with the hope to have the present benefit which I possess and hope to joy is little less in joy in jot than hope enjoyed. By this the weary lords shall make their way seem short, as mine hath done by sight of what I have, your noble company. Of much less value is my company than your good words. Wait, but who comes here? It is my son. Young Harry Percy, sent from my brother Booster, whencesoever. Harry, how fares your uncle? I thought, my lord, to have learned his health of you. Why? Is he not with the queen? No, my good lord, he hath forsook the court, broken his staff of office, and dispersed the household of the king. What was his reason? He was not so resolved when last we spake together. Because your lordship was proclaimed traitor. But he, my lord, is gone to Ravenspur to offer service to the Duke of Hereford, and sent me over by Berkeley to discover what power the Duke of York had levied there, then with directions to repair to Ravenspur. Have you forgot the Duke of Hereford, boy? No, my good lord, for that's not forgot, which ne'er I did remember. To my knowledge, I never in my life did look on him. Then learn to know him now. This is the Duke. My gracious lord, I, I tender you my service such as it is, being tender, raw, and young, which elder days shall ripen and confirm to more proved service and desert. I thank thee, gentle Percy, to in, and be sure I count myself in nothing else so happy as in good remembering of my good friends. And as my fortune ripens with thy love, it shall still be my true love's recompense. My heart this covenant makes, 
My hand thus seals it. Bolingbroke and Percy shake hands. How far is it to Berkeley? And what stir keeps good old York there with his men of war? There stands the castle by on tuft of trees, manned with 300 men, as I have heard. And in it, the lords of York, Berkeley, and Seymour, none else of name and noble estimate. Here comes the lords of Ross and Willoughby, bloody with spurring, fiery red with haste. Welcome, my lords. I what your love pursues a banished traitor. All my treasury is yet but unfelt thanks, which more enriched shall be your love and labor's recompense. Your presence makes us rich, most noble lord. And far surmounts our labor to attain it. <laughs> Ever more thanks. The exchequer of the poor, which to my infant fortune comes to years, stands for my bounty. But, but who comes here? It is my lord of Berkeley, as I guess. My lord, I hear for it. My message is for you. Uh, my lord, my answer is to Lancaster. And I am come to seek that name in England. And I must find that title in your tongue before I make reply to aught you say. Mistake me not, my lord. Tis not my meaning to raise one title of your honor out. To you, my lord, I come what lord you will from the most gracious regent of this land the duke of york to know what pricks you on to take advantage of this absent time and fright our native peace with self-born arms enter duke of york attended oh, i shall not need transport by words my words by you here comes his grace in person my noble uncle Bolingbroke kneels before York. Show me thy humble heart and not thy knee, whose duty is deceivable and false. My gracious uncle. Ta ta. Grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. I am no traitor's uncle, and that word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have those banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch a dust? of England's ground, but then more why? Why had they dared to march so many miles upon her peaceful bosom, frighting her pale-faced villages with war and ostentation of despised arms? Comest thou because the anointed king is hence? Why, foolish boy, the king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power. For I but now the lord of such hot youth as when brave gaunt thy father. And myself rescued the black prince, that young Mars of men, from forth the ranks of many thousand French. Oh, then how quickly should this arm of mine, now prisoner to the palsy, chastise thee and minister correction to thy fault? My gracious uncle, let me know my fault. On what condition stands it? And wherein? Even in condition of the worst degree, in gross rebellion and detested treason. Thou art a banished man, and here art come before the expiration of thy time in braving arms against thy sovereign. As I was banished, I was banished Hereford, but as I come, I come for Lancaster, and noble uncle, I beseech your grace, look on my wrongs with an indifferent eye. You are my father. For well, methinks in you I see old Gaunt alive. Oh, then my father, will you permit that I shall stand condemned, a wandering vagabond, my rights and royalties plucked from my arms perforce and given away to upstart unthrifts? Wherefore was I born? If that my cousin king be king of England, it must be granted that I am Duke of Lancaster. You have a son. Oh, Merle, my noble cousin, had you died first and he been trod down, you should have found his uncle Gaunt a father to rouse his wrongs and chase them to the bay. I am denied to sue my livery here, and yet my letters, patents, give me leave. My father's goods are all distrained and sold, and these are all 
are all a misemployed. What would you have me do? I am a subject and I challenge law. Attorneys are denied me and therefore personally, I lay my claim to my inheritance and free descent. The noble duke has been too much abused. It stands, Your Grace, upon to do him right. I am like, great. My laws of England, let me tell you this. I have had feeling of my cousin's wrongs and labored all I could to do him right. But in this kind to come, in braving arms, be his own carver and cut out his way to find out right with wrong, it may not be. And you that do abet him in this kind cherish rebellion and are rebels all. The noble duke hath sworn his coming is but for his own. And for the right of that, we all have strongly sworn to give him aid and let him ne'er see joy that breaks that oath. Well, well, I see the issue of these arms. I cannot mend it, I must needs confess. Because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all and make you stoop unto the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot, be it known to you, I do remain as neuter. So fare you well, unless you please to enter in the castle and there repose you for this night. An offer, uncle, that we will accept. But we must win your grace to go with us to Bristol Castle, where they say is held Bushy, Baggett, and their complice, accomplices, the caterpillars of the Commonwealth, which I have sworn to weed and pluck away. It may be I will go with you, but yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws. Nor friends nor foes to me welcome you are. Things past redress are now with me past care. They all exit. Act two, scene four, a camp in Wales. Enter Earl of Salisbury and a Welsh captain. I'll read, the, I'll read the Welsh captain. My Lord of Salisbury, we have stayed 10 days and hardly kept our countrymen together, and yet we hear no tidings from the king. Therefore, we will disperse ourselves. Farewell. Stay yet another day, thou trusty Welshman. The king reposeth all his confidence in thee. Tis thought the king is dead. We will not stay. The bay trees in our country are all withered, and meteors fright the fixed stars of heaven. The pale-faced moon looks bloody on the earth, and lean-looked prophets whisper fearful change. Rich men look sad, and ruffians dance and sleep, the one in fear to lose what they enjoy, the other to enjoy by rage and war. These signs forerun the death or fall of kings. Farewell. Our countrymen are gone and fled, as well assured Richard their king is dead. The Welsh uh, captain exits. Richard. With the eyes of heavy mind, I see thy glory like a shooting star fall to the base earth from the firmament. Thy sun sets weeping in the lowly west, witnessing storms to come, woe and unrest. Thy friends are fled to wait upon thy foes, and crossly to thy good all fortune goes. He exits. Act three, scene one, Bristol. Before the castle, enter Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of York, Northumberland, Lord Ross, Henry Percy, Lord Willoughby, with Bushy and Green as prisoners. Bring forth these men. 
<sighs> Bushy and green. I will not vex your souls, since presently your souls must part your bodies with too much urging your pernicious lives, but to no charity. Yet to wash your blood from off my hands, here in the view of men, I will unfold some causes of your deaths. You have misled a prince, a royal king, a happy gentleman in blood and liniment by you unhappied and disfigured clean. You have, un in manner, with your sinful hours, made a divorce betwixt his queen and him broke the possession of the royal bed and stained the beauty of a fair queen's cheeks with tears drawn from her eyes by your foul wrongs. Myself, a prince by fortune of my birth, near to the king in blood and near in love, till you did make him misinterpret me, have stooped my neck under your injuries oh, no. and sighed my English breath inside my English breath in foreign lands, um, eating the bitter bread of banishment, whilst I, you have fed upon this my sovereignties, disparked my parks, and felled my forest woods from my own windows of my household, torn my coats, raised out my impress, leaving me no sign save men's opinions and my living blood, to show the world that I am a gentleman, this, and much more, much more than twice all this, condemns you to the death. More welcome is the Either stroke of death or to or me than... The hands of death. More welcome is the stroke of death to me than Bolingbroke to England. Lord, farewell. My comfort is that heaven will take our souls and plague injustice with the pains of hell. My lord Northumberland, see them dispatched. Northumberland exits, leading the prisoners away. Uncle, you say the queen is at your house? For God's sakes, fairly let her be entreated. Tell her I send to her my kind commands and take special care my greetings be delivered. A gentleman of mine I have dispatched with letters of your love to her at large. Thanks, gentle uncle. Come, lords away, to fight with Glendower and his accomplices, a while to work, and after, holiday. They all exit. Act three, scene two. The coast of Wales, a castle in the distance. Enter King Richard, the Bishop of Carlisle, Duke of O'Merle and soldiers. Our lovely castle call they this at hand? Yea, my lord. How brooks your grace the air after your late tossing on the breaking seas? Needs must I like it well. I weep for joy to stand upon my kingdom once again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hand, though rebels wound thee with their horses' hoofs, as a long-parted mother with her child plays fondly with her tears and smiles in meeting. So, weeping, smiling, greet I thee, my earth, and do thee favours with my royal hands. Feed not thy sovereign's foe, my gentle earth, nor with thy sweet's comfort his ravenous sense but let thy spiders that suck up thy venom and heavy gated toads lie in their way, doing annoyance to their treacherous feet, which with usurping steps do trample thee. Yield stinging nettles to mine enemies. And when they from thy bosom pluck a flower, guard it, I pray thee, with a lurking adder, whose double tongue may with a mortal touch throw death upon thy sovereign's enemies. Mock not my senseless conjuration, lords. This earth shall have a feeling, and these stones prove armoured soldiers, ere her native king shall falter under foul rebellion's arms. B. 
Bishop of Carlisle, what say you? Fear not, my lord. That power that made you king hath power to keep you king in spite of all. The means that heaven yields must be embraced and not neglected. Else if heaven would and we will not, heaven's offer we refuse. The prophet means of succour and redress. He means, uh, my lord, that we are too remiss. Whilst Bolingbroke, through our security, grows strong and great in substance and in power. Discomfortable cousin, knowst thou not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe that lights the lower world, then thieves and robbers range abroad unseen in murders and in outrage boldly here? But when from under this terrestrial ball he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines and darts his light through every guilty hole, then murders, treasons, and detested sins, the cloak of night being plucked from off their backs, stand bare and naked, trembling at themselves. So when this thief, this traitor Bolingbroke, whom all the while hath reveled in the night whilst we were wandering with the Antipodes, shall see us rising in our throne, the east. His treasons will sit blushing in his face, not able to endure the sight of day, but self-affrighted, tremble at his sin. Not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the duty elected by the Lord. For every man that Bullingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown. God for Richard hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then if angels fight, weak men must fall, for heaven still guards the right. Enter Earl of Salisbury. Welcome, my lord. How far off lies your power? Nor near nor farther off, my gracious lord, than this weak arm. Discomfort guides my tongue and bids me speak of nothing but despair. One day too late, I fear me, noble Lord, hath clouded all thy happy days on earth. Oh, call back yesterday, bid time return, and thou shalt have 12,000 fighting men. Today, today, unhappy day, too late, or throws thy joys, friends, fortune, and thy state. For all the Welshmen, hearing thou wert dead, are gone to Bolingbroke, dispersed, and fled. Comfort, my liege, why looks your grace so pale? But now the blood of 20,000 men did triumph in my face, and they are fled. And till so much blood thither come again, have I not reason to look pale and dead? All souls that will be safe fly from my side, for time hath set a blot upon my pride. Comfort, my liege, remember who you are. I had forgot myself. Am I not king? Awake, thou coward majesty, thou sleepst. Is not the king's name twenty thousand names? Arm, arm, my name. A puny subject strikes at thy great glory. Look not to the ground, ye favourites of a king. Are we not high? High be our thoughts. I know my uncle York, York hath power enough to serve our term, term. Uh, but who comes here? Enter Sir Stephen Scroop. More health and happiness betide my liege than can my care tuned tongue deliver him. Mine ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. Say, is my kingdom lost? Why, t'was my care and what loss is it to be rid of care? Strives Bullingbroke to be as great as we? Greater he shall not be. If he serve God, we'll serve him too and be his fellow so. Revolt our subjects? That we cannot mend. They break their faith to God as well as us. Cry woe, destruction, ruin and decay. The worst is death and death will have his day. Glad am I that, uh, glad am I that your highness is so armed to bear the tidings of calamity. 
like an unseasonable stormy day, which makes the silver rivers drown their shores, as if the world were all dissolved to tears. So high above his limits swells the rage of Bolingbroke, covering your fearful land with hard, bright steel and hearts harder than steel. White beards have armed their thin and hairless scalps against thy majesty. Boys with women's voices strive to speak big and clap their female joints in stiff, unwieldy arms against thy crown. Thy very beadsmen learn to bend their bows of double fatal you against thy state. Ye, this stuff women manage rusty bills against thy seat. Both old and young rebel and all goes worse than I have power to tell. Too well. Too well thou tellst the tale so ill. Where is the Earl of Wiltshire? Where is Bagot? What has become of Bushy? Where is Green? That they have let the dangerous enemy measure our confines with such peaceful steps? If we prevail, their heads shall pay for it. I warrant they have made peace with Bullingbrook. Peace have they made with him indeed, my lord. Oh, villains, vipers, damned without redemption. Dogs easily want to fall on any man. Snakes in my hot blood warm that sting my heart. Three Judases. Each one thrice worse than Judas. Would they make peace? Terrible hell make war upon their spotted souls for this offense. Sweet love, I see, changing his property, turns to the sourest and most deadly hate. Again, uncurse their souls. Their peace is made with heads and not with hands. Those whom you curse have felt the worst of death's destroying wound and lie full low, graved in the hollow ground. Is Bushy, Green, and the Earl of Wiltshire dead? Aye, all of them at Bristol lost their heads. Where is the Duke, my father, with his power? No matter where, of comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms, and epitaphs. Make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills. And yet not so, for what can we bequeath, save our deposed bodies to the ground, our lands, our lives, and all of Bullingbrooks? And nothing can we call our own but death, and that small model of the barren earth, which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, to be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh, which walls our life, were brass impregnable and humoured thus, comes at the last and with a little pin, bores through his castle wall, and farewell, king. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty, or you have but mistook me all this while. 
I live with bread like you. Feel want, taste grief, need friends, subjected thus. How can you say to me, I am a king? My Lord, wise men ne'er sit and wail their woes, but presently prevent the ways to wail. To fear the foe, since fear oppresseth strength, gives in your weakness strength unto your foe. And so your follies fight against yourself. Fear and be slain. No worse can come to fight, and fight and die is death destroying death while fearing dying pays death's servile breath. My father hath a power. Inquire of him and learn to make a body of a limb. Thou chides me well. Proud Bullingbrock, I come to change blows with thee for our day of doom. This ague fit of fear is overblown. An easy task is it to win our own. Say, Scroop. Where lies our uncle with his power? Speak sweetly, man, although thy looks be sour. Men judge by the complexion of the sky, the state and inclination of the day. So may you, by my dull and heavy eye, my tongue hath but a heavier tale to say. I play the torturer by small and small, to lengthen out the words that must be spoken. Your uncle York is joined with Bolingbroke, and all your northern castles yielded up, and all your southern gentlemen in arms upon his party. Thou hast said enough. Beshrew thee, cousin which did lead me, did lead me forth of that sweeter way I was into despair. What say you now? What comfort have we now? By heaven, I'll hate him everlastingly. That bids me of comfort any more. Go to Flint Castle. There I'll pine away. A king, woe slave, shall kingly woe obey. That power I have, discharge, and let them go to ear the land that hath some hope to grow, for I have none. Let no man speak again to alter this, for counsel is but vain. My liege, one word. He does me double wrong that wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. Discharge my followers. Let them hence away. For Richard's night to Bullingbrook's fair day. They exit. And at that, ladies and gentlemen, we will take a five minute intermission if you need to do anything at all. Now is the time to do it. We will be back in five minutes with the second part of the life and death of Richard II. And we'll stay on this same video, obviously. We're not changing videos. We'll be right back.
<clears throat> oh, hello. Welcome back to part two of The Life and Death of Richard II by William Shakespeare. On, on we go. Act three, scene three. Wales, before Flint Castle. Enter with drum and colours, Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of York, Northumberland, attendants and forces. So, by this intelligence we learn the Welshmen are dispersed. And Salisbury has gone to meet the king, who lately landed with some few private friends upon this coast. The news is very fair and good, my lord. Richard, not far from hence, hath hit his head. <laughs> it would beseem the L Lord Northumberland to say, King Richard, <laughs> alack the day when such a sacred king should hide his head. Your grace mistakes. Only to be brief, left I his title out. The time hath been, would you have been so brief with him, he would have been so brief with you to shorten you, for taking so the head, your whole head's length. Mistake not, uncle, further than you should. Take not, good cousin, further than you should, lest you mistake. The heavens are o'er our heads. I know it, uncle, and oppose not myself against their will. Ah, but who comes here? Enter Henry Percy. Welcome, Harry. What, will not this castle yield? Castle royally is manned, my lord, against thy entrance. Royally? What? Why? It contains a king? Yes, my good lord, it doth contain a king. King Richard lies within yon Lyman's stone. With him are the Lord O'Murrell, Lord Salisbury, Sir Stephen Scroop, besides a uh, clergyman of holy reverence who I cannot learn. Oh, belike it is the Bishop of Carlisle. Hmm. Noble lords. Go to the rude ribs of that ancient castle, through brazen trumpet, send the breath of Pali into the ruin, his ruined ears, and deliver uh, Henry Bolingbroke on both his knees, doth kiss King Richard's hand, and sends allegiance and true faith of heart to his most royal person. Hither come, even at his feet, to lay my arms and power provided that my banishment repealed and lands restored again be freely granted. If not, I'll use the advantage of my power and lay the summer's dust with showers of blood rained from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen, the which, how far off from the mind of Bolingbroke it is, such crimson tempest should be drenched the fresh green lap of fair King Richard's land. My stooping duty tenderly shall show. Go, signify as much. Well, here we march upon this grassy carpet of this plain. And let's march without the noise of threatening drum. And from this castle, tattered battlements, our fair appointments may well be perused. <sighs> Methinks King Richard and myself should meet with no less terror than the elements of fire and water in their thundering shock at meeting, as, at meeting tears the cloudy cheeks of heaven. Be he the fire, I'll be the yielding water. The rage be his, whilst on earth I reign. My waters on the earth and not on him. March on. And mark how King Richard looks. Bolingbroke's soldiers march. There is a call to Pal without. There is an answer from within. And then a flourish. Enter on the walls, King Richard, the Bishop of Carlisle, Duke of Omerl, Sir Stephen Scroop, and Earl of Salisbury. See, 
See, King Richard doth himself appear, as doth the blushing discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east, when he perceives an envious clouds are bent to dim his glory and stain the track of his bright passage to the Occident. Yet he looks like a king. Mm. Behold, his eye as bright as is the eagle's, lightens forth controlling majesty. Alack, alack for woe that any harm should stain so fair a show. We are amazed, and thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know no hand of blood and bone can gripe the sacred handle of our scepter unless he do profane, steal, or usurp. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls by turning them from us, we are barren and bereft of friends. Yet know, my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot that lift your vassal hands against my head and threat the glory of my precious crown. Tell Bullingbroke, for yond methinks he stands that every stride he makes upon my land is dangerous treason. He has come to open the purple testament of bleeding war, but ere the crown he looks for live in peace, 10,000 bloody crowns of mother's sons shall ill become the flower of England's face, change the complexion of her male, made pale peace to scarlet indignation and bedew her pastures grass with faithful English blood. The king of heaven forbid our lord the king should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy thrice noble cousin, Harry Bolingbroke, doth humbly kiss thy hand, and by the honorable tomb, he swears, that stands upon your royal grandsire's bones, and by the royalties of both your bloods, currents that spring from one most gracious head, and by the buried hand of warlike gaunt, and by the worth and honor of himself, comprising all that may be sworn or said, his coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties, and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees, which on thy royal party granted once his glittering arms, he will commend to rust his barbed steeds to stables and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears he, as he is a prince and just, and as I am a gentleman, I credit him. Northumberland, say thus the king returns. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without contradiction. With all the gracious utterance thou hast, speak to his gentle hearing kind commends. Northumberland returns to Bolingbroke. We do debase ourselves, cousin, do we not? To look so poorly and to speak so fair. Shall we call back Northumberland and send defiance to the traitor? And so die? No, good my lord. Let's fight with gentle words till time lend friends and friends at their helpful swords. Oh God, oh God, that ere this tongue of mine that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud man should take it off again with words of sooth. Oh, that I were as great as is my grief or lesser than my name or that I could forget what I have been, or not remember what I must be now. Swell'st thou, proud heart? I'll give thee scope to beat, since foes have scope to beat both thee and me. Northumberland comes back from Bolingbroke. What must the king do now? 
Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? For God's name, let it go. I'll give my jewels for a set of beads, my gorgeous palace for a hermitage, my gay apparel for an almsman gown, my figured goblets for a dish of wood, my scepter for a palmer's walking staff, my subjects for a pair of carved saints and my large kingdom for a little grave. A little grave. A little grave. An obscure grave. Or I'll be buried in the king's highway, some way of common trade, where subjects' feet, feet make hourly trample on the, their sovereign's head. For on my heart they tread now whilst I live and buried once, why not upon my head? O Mel, thou weepst, my tender-hearted cousin, will make foul weather with despised tears. Our sighs and they shall lodge the summer corn and make a dearth in this revolting land. Or shall we play the wantons with our woes and make some pretty match with shedding tears? As thus, to drop them still upon one place till they have fretted us a pair of graves within the earth and therein lid. There lies two kinsmen digged their graves with weeping eyes. Will not this ill do well? Well, well, I see I talk but idly, and you laugh at me. Northumberland approaches. Most mighty prince, my lord Northumberland, what says King Bullingbroke? Will his majesty give Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a leg. And Bullingbroke says I. My lord, in the base court he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down. Down. Down I come like glistering phaeton, wanting the manage of unruly jades in the base court, base court where kings grow base, to come at traitors' calls and do them grace in the base court, come down. Down court, down king, for night owls shriek where mounting larks should sing. King Richard exits from above. What says his majesty? Sorrow and grief of heart make him speak fondly like a frantic man, yet he is come. King Richard enters below. Stand all apart and show fair duty to his majesty. He kneels before King Richard. My gracious lord. Fair cousin, you debase your princely knee to make the base earth proud with kissing it. Me rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your courtesy. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know. Thus high at least, although your knee be low. Bolingbroke stands. My gracious Lord, I come but for mine own. Your own is yours. And I am yours and all. So far be mine, my most redoubted Lord, as my true service shall deserve your love. Well, you deserve. They well deserve to have that know the strongest and surest way to get. Uncle, give me your hands. Nay, dry your eye. Tears show their love, but want their remedies. Cousin, I am too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give and willing to, for do we must what force will have us do. Set on towards London, Cousin, is it thus? Yes, my good lord. Then I must not say no. They all exit.
Act three, scene four. Langley, the Duke of York's garden. Enter the queen and two ladies in waiting. What spot shall we devise here in this garden to drive away the heavy thought of care? Madam, we'll play at bowls. They'll make me think the world is full of rubs and that my fortune rubs against the bias. Madam, we'll dance. My legs can keep no measure in delight when my poor heart no measure keeps in grief. Therefore, no dancing go. Some other sport. Madam, we'll tell tales. Of sorrow or of joy? Of either, madame. Of neither, girl. For if of joy, being altogether wanting, it doth remember me the more of sorrow. Or if of grief, being altogether had, it adds more sorrow to my want of joy. For what I have, I need not to repeat. And what I want, it boots not to complain. Madam, I'll sing. <laughs> this well that thou hast caused, but thou shouldest please me better. Would thou weep? I could weep, madam. Would it do you good? And I could sing. <laughs> Would weeping do me good and never borrow any tear of thee? Enter a gardener and two servants. But stay, here come the gardeners. Let's step into the shadow of these trees. My wretchedness unto a row of pins. They'll talk of state, of everyone that's so against that change. Woe is forerun with woe. The queen and her ladies step aside and observe. Go, bind thou up yon dangling apricots, which, like unruly children, make their sire stoop with oppression of their prodigal weight. But give some supportance to the bending twigs. Go thou, and, like an executioner, cut off the heads of two fast-growing sprays that look too lofty in our commonwealth. All must be even in our government. You, thus employed, I will go root away the noisome weeds, which without profit suck the soil's fertility from wholesome flowers. Why should we, in the compass of pale, keep law and form and due proportion, showing, as in a model, our firm estate, when our sea-walled garden, the whole land is full of weeds? Her fairest flowers choked up, her fruit trees all upturned, her hedges ruined, her knots disordered, and her wholesome herbs swarming with caterpillars. Oh, oh, hold thy peace. But he that hath suffered this disordered spring hath now himself met with the fall of leaf. The weeds which his broad spreading leaves did shelter, that seemed in eating him to hold him up, are plucked up by root and all by Bolingbroke. I mean the Earl of Wiltshire, bushy, green. What are they there? Oh, they are. And Bolingbroke hath seized the wasteful king. Oh, what a pity is it that he had not so trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden. <laughs> ah, we at time of year do wound the bark the skin of our fruit trees, lest being overproud in sap and blood with too much riches, it confound itself. Had he done so to great and growing men, they might have lived to bear and he to taste their fruits of duty. Superfluous branches we lop away, that bearing boughs may live. Had he done so himself had borne the crown, which waste of idle hours hath quite thrown down. What, think you then the king shall be deposed? How well, depressed he is already, and deposed his doubt he will be. Letters came last night to a dear friend of the good Duke of York's that tell all black tidings. 
Oh, I am pressed to death through want of speaking. Thou, old Adam's likeness, set to dress this garden. How dares thy rash root tongue sound this unpleasant news? What if, what serpent thou suggest thee to make a second fall of cursed men? Why, dost thou say King Richard is deposed? There is thou, thou little better thing than urge, divine his downfall? Say, where, when, and how comest thou by this ill tidings? Speak, thou wretch. Pardon me, madam. Little joy have I to breathe this news. Yet what I say is true. King Richard, he is in the mighty hold of Bolingbroke. Their fortunes both are weighed. In your lord's scale is nothing but himself and some few vanities that make him light. But in the balance of great Bolingbroke, besides himself are all the English peers. And with that odds, he weighs King Richard down. Post you to London and you will find it so. I speak no more than everyone doth know. Nimble mischance that our so light of foot doth not dying passage belong to me. And am I less that knows it? Oh, thou thinkest to serve me less that I may longest keep thy sorrow in my breast. Come, ladies, go to meet the at London, London's king in woe. What? Was I born to this, that my sad looks should grace the triumph of great Bolingbroke? Gardner, for telling me these news of, oh, I pray God the plants thou graphites may never grow. Exit the Queen and her ladies. Poor Queen so that thy state might be no worse. I would my skill was subject to thy curse. Here did she fall a tear. Here in this place I'll set a bank of rue, sour herb of grace. Rue even for Ruth here shortly shall be seen in the remembrance of a weeping queen. Exit all. Act 4, Scene 1. Westminster Hall. Enter as to the Parliament, Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of Omerl, Northumberland, Henry Percy, Lord Fitzwater, Duke of Surrey, the Bishop of Carlisle, the Abbot of Westminster, other lords, heralds, officers, and Bagot. Call forth, Bagot. Now... Baggett is brought forth by officers. Baggett, freely speak thy mind. What dost thou know of noble Gloucester's death? Who wrought it with the king and who performed the bloody offer of his timely end? And set before my face the Lord O'Merle. Cousin? Stand forth. And look upon that man. My Lord O'Merle, I know your daring tongue spawns and say what once it hath delivered. In that dead time when Gloucester's death was plotted, I heard you say, is not my arm of length that reacheth from the restful English court as far as Callis for mine uncle's head? Amongst much other talk that very time, I heard you say that you had rather refused the offer of an hundred thousand crowns than Bolingbroke's return to England. Adding withal how blessed that this land would be in this your cousin's death. 
princes and noble lords, what answer shall I make to this base man? Shall I so much dishonor my fair stars on equal Sorry. terms to give him chastisement? Either I must or have mine honor soiled with the attainder of his slanderous lips. There is my gauge, the manual seal of death that marks thee out for hell. I say thou liest and will maintain what thou hast said is false in thy heart blood, though being all too base to stain the temper of my knightly sword. Bag it forbear, thou shalt not take it up. Excepting one, I would he were the best in all this presence that have moved me so. If that thy valour stand on sympathy, there is my gauge or merle engaged to thine. By that fair sign which shows me where thou standest, I heard thee say, and vaultingly thou spakest it, that thou wert cause of noble Gloucester's death. If thou deniest twenty times, thou liest, and I will turn thy falsehood to thy heart where it was forged with my rapier's point. Thou darest not, coward, live to see that day. Now by my soul I would it were this hour. Fitzwater, thou art damned to hell for this. O Merle, thou liest. His honour is as true in this appeal as thou art all unjust, and that thou art so, there I throw my gauge to prove it on thee to the extremest point of mortal breathing. Seize it, if thou darest. O Merle takes up the gauge. My hands rot off and never brandish more revengeful steel over the glittering helmet of my foe. I task the earth to the like, forsworn O Merle and spur thee on with full as many lies as may be hollowed in thy treacherous ear from sun to sun. There is my honour's pawn. Engage it to the trial if thou darest. O Merle takes up the gauge. By heaven I'll throw it all. I have a thousand spirits in one breast to answer twenty thousand such as you. My lord Fitzwater, I do remember well the very time O Merlin you did talk. It is very true, you were in presence then, and you can witness with me this is true. As false by heaven, as heaven itself is true. Sorry, thou liest. Dishonourable boy, that lie shall lie so heavy on my sword that it shall render vengeance and revenge till thou, the lie-giver, and that lie do lie in earth as quiet as thy father's skull. In proof whereof, there is my honour's pawn. Engage it to the trial, if thou darest. Fitzwater takes up the gauge. How fondly dost thou spur a forward horse. If I dare eat or drink or breathe or live, I dare meet sorry in a wilderness and spit upon him while I say he lies and lies and lies. There is my bonded face to tie thee to my strong correction. Fitzwater <sighs> throws down the gauge. As I intend to thrive in this new world, Ormel is guilty of my true appeal. Besides, I heard the banished Norfolk say that thou, Ormerle, didst send two of thy men to execute the noble duke at Callis. Some honest Christian, trust me with a gauge. A lord hands Ormerle a gauge, and Ormerle throws it down. That Norfolk lies. Here do I throw down this, if he may be repealed to try his honour. These differences shall all rest under gauge till Norfolk be repealed. Repealed he shall be, and though by mine enemy restored again to all his lands and seigneuries. When he's returned against Ormerl, we will enforce his trial. That honourable day shall never be seen. Many a time hath banished Norfolk fought for Jesu Christ in glorious Christian field, streaming the ensign of the Christian cross against black pagans, Turks, and Saracen, and toiled with works of war, retired himself to Italy, and there at Venice gave his body to that pleasant country's earth, and his pure soul unto his captain Christ, under whose colours he had fought so long. What? Bishop? Is Norfolk dead? As surely as I live, my lord. A sweet peace conducts his sweet soul to the bosom of good old Abraham. 
Very lords appellants, your differences shall all rest under gauge till we assign you to your days of trial. Enter Duke of York, attended. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from plume plucked Richard, who with willing soul adopts thee heir, and his eye scepter yields to the possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry, forth of that name. In God's name, I, I'll ascend the regal throne. Harry, God forbid. Worst in his royal presence may I speak, yet best beseeming me to speak the truth. Would God that any in this noble presence were noble enough to be upright judge of noble Richard, then true noblesse would let him learn him forbearance from so foul a wrong. What subject can give sentence on his king? And who sits here that is not Richard's subject? Thieves are not judged, but they are by to hear, although apparent guilt be seen in them. And shall the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy elect, anointed crown, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath, and he himself not present? Oh, forfend it, though, that in a Christian climate, souls refined should show, show so heinous, black, obscene a deed. I speak to subjects, and a subject speaks, stirred up by God thus boldly for his king. My lord of Hereford here, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to proud Hereford's king, and if you crown him, let me prophesy, the blood of English shall manure the ground, and future ages groan for this foul act. Peace shall go sleep with Turks and infidels, and in this seat of peace tumultuous wars shall kin with kin and kind with kind confound. Disorder, horror, fear, and mutiny shall here inhabit, and this land be called the field of Golgotha and dead men's skulls. Oh, if you raise this house against this house, it will the wofulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Prevent it. Resist it, let it be not so, lest child, child's children cry against you, woe. Well have you argued, sir, and for your pains, of capital treason we arrest you here. My Lord Westminster, be it your charge to keep him safely till his day of trial. May it please you, lords, to grant the commons suit. Fetch hither, Richard that in common view he may surrender. So we shall proceed without suspicion. I will be his conduct. The Duke of York exits. Lords, you that are here under arrest, procure your sureties for your days of answer. Little are we beholdings to your love and little looked for at your helping hands. Re-enter Duke of York with King Richard and officers bearing the regalia. Alack, why am I sent for to a king before I have shook off the regal forts wherewith I reigned? I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my limbs. Give sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission, yet I will remember the favours of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometime cry, all hail to me? So Judas did to Christ, but he in 12 found truth in all but one. I in 12,000, none. God save the king. Will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, amen. God save the king, although I be not he. And yet, amen, if heaven do think him me. To do what service am I sent for hither? Do that office of thine own goodwill, which tied majesty did make thee offer. 
the resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. Give me the crown. Here, cousin. Seize the crown. Here, cousin. On this side of my hand, on that side thine. Now is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets, filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down, unseen and full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs whilst you mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown, I am but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs. Still am I king of those. Part of your cares you give me with your crown. Your cares set up do not pluck my cares down. My care is loss of care by old care done. Your care is gain of care by new care won. The cares I give, I have, though given away, they tend the crown, yet still with me they stay. Are you contented to resign the crown? I, no, no, I, for I must nothing be. Therefore, no, no, for I resign to thee. Now mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head and this unwieldy scepter from my hand, the pride of kingly sway from out of my heart. With mine own tears, I wash away my balm. With mine own hands, I give away my crown. With, my, no, with mine own tongue, deny my sacred state with mine own breath, release all duties, rights. All pomp and majesty, I do forswear. My manners, rents, revenues, I forego. My acts, decrees, and statutes, I deny. God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke that swear to thee. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieved, and thou with all pleased that hast all achieved. Long mayest thou live in Richard's seat to sit, and soon lie Richard in an earthly pit. God save King Harry, unkinged Richard says, and send him many years of sunshine days. What more remains? No more but that you read these accusations and these grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and profit of this land, that by confessing them, the souls of men may deem that you are worthily deposed. Must I do so? And must I ravel out my weaved up folly? Gentle Northumberland, if thy offences were upon record, would it not shame thee in so fair a troop to read a lecture of them? If thou wouldst, there shouldst thou found one heinous article containing the deposing of a king and cracking the strong warrant of an oath marked with a blot, damned in the book of heaven. Nay, all of you that stand and look upon me, whilst that my wretchedness doth bait itself, though some of you, with Pilate, wash your hands! showing an outward pity, yet you pilots have here delivered me to my sour cross and water cannot wash away your sins. My Lord, dispatch, read all these articles. Mine eyes are full of tears, I cannot see, and yet salt water blinds them not so much but they can see a sort of traitors here. Nay, if I turn mine eyes upon myself, I find myself a traitor with the rest. For I have given here my soul's consent to undeck the pompous body of a king, made glory base and sovereignty a slave, 
proud majesty, a subject, state, a peasant. My lord. No lord of thine. Thou halt insulting man, nor no man's lord. I have no name, no title, no. Not that name was given me at the font, but tis usurped. Alack the heavy day that I have worn so many winters out and know not now what name to call myself. Oh, that I were a mockery king of snow, standing before the sun of Bullingbroke to melt myself away in water drops. Good king, great king, and yet not greatly good. And if my word be sterling yet in England, let it command a mirror hither straight, that it may show me what face I have, since it is a bankrupt of his majesty. Go, some of you, and fetch the looking glass. An attendant exits. Read o'er this paper while the glass doth come. Fiend, thou torment'st me ere I come to hell. Urge it no more, no, Lord Northumberland. The commons will not then be satisfied. They shall be satisfied. I'll read enough when I do see the very book indeed where all my sins are writ, and that's myself. Re-enter attendant with a looking glass. Give me the glass, and therein will I read. <laughs> no deeper wrinkles yet. Hath sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine and made no deeper wounds, O oh, flattering glass. Like to my followers in prosperity, thou dost beguile me. Was this face the face that every day under his household roof did keep 10,000 men? Was this the face that like the sun did make beholders wink? Was this the face that faced so many follies and was at last outfaced by Bullingbrook. A brittle glory shineth in this face, as brittle as the glory is the face. Richard deliberately smashes the mirror on the floor. For well, there it is, cracked in a hundred shivers. Mark, silent king, the moral of this sport. How soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. Say that again. The shadow of my sorrow. Huh. Let's see. It is very true. My grief lies all within and these external manners of laments are merely shadows to the unseen grief that swells with silence in the tortured soul. There lies the substance. And I thank thee, King, for thy great bounty that not only gives me cause to wail, but teaches me the way how to lament the cause. I'll beg one boon and then be gone and trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it? Name it, fair cousin. Fair cousin. I am greater than the King. For when I was a king, my flatterers were then but subjects. Being now a subject, I have a king here to my flatterer. Being so great, I have no need to beg. Yet ask. And shall I have? You shall. Then give me leave to go. Whither? Whither you will, so I were from your sights. Go, some of you, convey him to the tower. Oh, good. Convey. Conveyors are you all that rise thus nimbly by a true king's fall. Exit King Richard, guarded, and some lords. On Wednesday next, we solemnly set down our coronation. Lords, prepare yourselves. Exit all except the Bishop of Carlisle, the Abbot of Westminster, and the Duke of O'Merle.
the woes to come. The children yet unborn shall feel this day as sharp to them as thorn. You holy clergyman, is there no plot to rid the realm of this pernicious blot? My lord, before I freely speak my mind herein, you shall not only take the sacrament to bury mine intents, but also to effect whatever I shall happen to devise. I see your brows are full of discontent, your hearts of sorrow and your eyes of tears. Come home with me to supper, and I'll lay a plot shall show us all a merry day. They all exit. Act 5, Scene 1. London, a street leading to the tower. Enter Richard's Queen and her ladies-in-waiting. This way the king will come. This is the way to Julius Caesar's ill-erected tower, to whose flint bosom my condemned lord is doom, a prisoner by proud Bolingbroke. He'll let us rest. If this rebellious earth have any resting for her true king's queen. Enter King Richard, guarded. A soft. But see, or rather do not see my fair rose wither. Yet look up. Behold, that you in pity may dissolve to deal and wash him fresh again with true love tears. Ah, uh, thou, the mother where old Troy did stand, thou, map of honor, thou, King Richard's tomb and not King Richard, thou, the most beauteous in, why should hard favorite grief be locked in thee when triumph is become an alehouse guest? Do I not with grief, fair woman, do not so, to make my end too sudden? Learn, good soul, to think our former state a happy dream from which we awaked. The truth of what we are shows us but this. I am sworn brother, sweet to grim necessity, and he and I will keep a league till death. Hie thee to France and cloister thee in some religious house. Our holy lives must win a new world's crown, which our profane hours hath here hath thrown down. What? Is my Richard both in shape and my transformed and weakened? Had Bolingbroke deposed thy intellect? Had he heaven in thy heart? The lion die and trust thee for his paw and wounds the earth, if nothing else, with rage to be overpowered. And wit thou, poop you like, take thy correction mildly, kiss the rod, and fawn on rage with base humility, which art a lion and a king of beasts. A king of beasts indeed. If aught but beasts, I had been still a a happy king of men. Good sometime queen, prepare thee hence for France. Think I am dead, and that even here thou takest, as from my deathbed, thy last living leave. In winter's tedious night, sit by the fire with good old folks and let them tell thee tales of woeful age, ages long ago betid. And ere thou bid good night to quiet their griefs, tell thou the lamentable tale of me and send the hearers weeping to their beds. For why the senseless brands will sympathize the heavy accent of thy moving tongue and in compassion weep the fire out. And some will mourn in ashes, some coal black for the deposing of a rightful king. My lord, the mind of Bullingbroke is changed. You must to Pomfret, not unto the tower. And, madam, there is order tamed for you. With all swift speed, you must away to France. Northumberland, thou ladder wherewithal the mounting Bullingbroke ascends my throne. 
The time shall not be many hours of age, more than it is ere foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. Thou shalt think, though he divide the realm and give thee half, it is too little helping him to all. He shall think that thou, which knowest the way to plant unrightful kings, wilt know again, being ne'er so little urged, another way to pluck him headlong from the usurped throne. The love of wicked men converts to fear, that fear to hate, and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death. My guilt be on my head and there an end. Take leave and part, for you must part forthwith. Doubly divorced, bad men. You violate a twofold marriage twixt my crown and me, and then betwixt me and my married wife. Let me unkiss the oath twixt thee and me, and yet not so, for with a kiss twas made. Part us, Northumberland. I toward the north, where shivering cold and sickness pines the climb. My wife to France, from whence set forth in pomp, she came adorned hither like sweet May, sent back like Hallowmas or, or shorts of day. And must we be divided? Must we part? Aye, hand from hand, my love, and heart from heart. Banish us both and send the king with me. Oh, that were some love, but little policy. Then whither he goes, tither let me go. So too, together weeping make one woe. Weep thou for me in France, I for thee here. Better far off than near, but ne'er be near the near. Go, count thy way with sighs, I mine with groans. So longest way shall have the longest most. Twice for one step I'll groan, the way being short, and piece the way out with a heavy heart. Come, come in wooing, sorrow let's be brief, since wedding it there is such length in grief. One kiss shall stop our mouths and dumbly part. Thus, Give I mine, and thus take I thy heart. They kiss. Give me mine own again. Do I no good part to take on me to keep and kill thy heart? So now I have mine own again. Be gone, that I might strive to kill it with the groan. They kiss again. We make woe wanton with this fond delay. Once more adieu, the rest let sorrow say. Exit all. Act five, scene two, the Duke of York's palace. Enter Duke of York and Duchess of York. My Lord, you told me you would tell the rest when weeping made you break the story off of our two cousins coming into London. Where did I leave? At that sad stop, my lord, where rude misgoverned hands from windows tops threw dust and rubbish on King Richard's head. Then, as I said, the Duke, Great Bolingbroke, mounted upon a hot and fiery steed, which his aspiring rider seemed to know, with slow but stately pace kept on his course, whilst all tongues cried, God save thee, Bolingbroke. You would have thought the very windows spake, so many greedy looks of young and old through casements darted their desiring eyes upon his visage, and that all the walls with painted imagery had said at once, Jesu preserve thee, welcome, Bolingbroke. Whilst he, from the one side to the other turning, bareheaded, lower than his proud steed's neck, bespake them thus, I thank you, countrymen, and thus still doing, thus he passed along. Luck, poor Richard, where have rode he the whilst? 
As in a theater, the eyes of men after a well-graced actor leaves the stage, are idly bent on him that enters next, thinking his prattle to be tedious. Even so, or with so much more contempt, men's eyes did scowl on gentle Richard. No man cried, God save him. No joyful tongue gave him his welcome home, but dust was thrown upon his sacred head, which with such gentle sorrow he shook off, his face still combating with tears and smiles, the badges of his grief and patience, that had not God, for some strong purpose, steeled the hearts of men, they must perforce have melted and barbarism itself have pitied him. But heaven hath a hand in these events, to whose high will we bound our calm contents. To Bolingbroke are we sworn subjects now, whose state and honor I for I allow. Oh, here comes my son, or Merle. Or Merle that was, but that is lost for being Richard's friend. And madam, we must call him Rutland now. I'm in Parliament pledge for his truth and lasting fealty to the new made king. Enter Duke of Omerle. Welcome, my son. Who are the violets now that strew the green lap of the newcome spring? Madam, I know not, nor I greatly care not. God knows I had as leaf be none as one. Well, bear you well in this new spring of time lest you be cropped before you come to prime. What news from Oxford hold those joust and triumphs? For what I know, my lord, they do. You, you will be there, I know. If God prevent not, I purpose so. What seal is that that hangs without thy bosom? Yea, looks thou pale, let me see the writing. My lord, it is nothing. No matter then who see it. I will be satisfied. Let me see the writing. I do beseech your grace to pardon me. It is a matter of small consequence, which for some reasons I would not have seen. Which for some reason, sir, I mean to see. Oh, I fear, I fear. What do you should fear? Tis nothing but some bond that he has entered into for gay apparel against the triumph day. Bound to himself. What doth he with a bond that he is bound to? Why thou art a fool? Boy, let me see thy writing. I do beseech you, pardon me. I may not show it. I will be satisfied. Let me see it, I say. He takes the paper from Omerle and reads it. Treason. Foul treason, villain, traitor, slave. What is the matter, my lord? Oh, who is within there? Saddle my horse. God for his mercy, what treachery is here? Why, what is it, my lord? Give me my boots, I say. Saddle my horse. Now, by mine honour, by my life, by my truth, I will impeach the villain. What is the matter? Peace, foolish woman. I will not peace. Well, what is the matter, Omel? Good mother, be content. It, it, it is no more than my poor life must answer. Thy life answer? Bring me my boots. I will unto the king. Servant enters with York's boots. Strike him, Omel. Poor boy, thou art amazed. Hence, villain, and never come in my sight. Give me my boots, I say. Why, York, what wilt thou do? Hmm? Wilt thou not hide the trespass of thine own? Have we more sons, or are we like to have? Is not my teeming date drunk up with time? And wilt thou pluck my fair son from mine age and rob me of a happy mother's name? Is he not like thee? Is he not thine own? Thou fond mad woman, wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy? A dozen of them here have taken the sacrament and interchangeably set their hands down to kill the king at Oxford. He shall be none. We'll keep him here. Then what is that to him? Away, fond woman. Were he twenty times my son, I would appeach him. Hadst thou groan for him as I have done, thou wouldst be more pitiful. 
now I know thy mind. Thou dost suspect that I have been disloyal to thy bed, and that he is a bastard, not thy son. Oh, sweet York, sweet husband, be not of that mind. He is as like thee as man may be, and not like me or any of my kin, and yet I love him. Make way, unruly woman. He exits. After, Omerl, mount thee upon his horse, spur post, and get before him to the king, and beg thee thy pardon, ere he do accuse thee. Oh, I'll not be long behind, though I be old. I doubt not but to ride as fast as York, but never will I rise up from the ground till Bullingbrook have pardoned thee away. Be gone. They both exit. Act five, scene three, a royal palace. Enter Bolingbrook, now King Henry the Fourth, with Henry Percy and other lords. Can no man tell me of my unthrifty son? It is three full three months since I did see him last. God, if any plague hangs over us, tis he. Would to God, my lords, he might be found. Inquire at London, amongst the taverns there, for there they say he daily doth frequent with unrestrained loose companions, even such they say, that stand in narrow lanes and beat our watch and rob our passengers, which he, young Walton and a feminine boy, takes on the point of honor to support some dis dissolute crew. My lord, some two days since I saw the prince and told him of those triumphs held at Oxford. And what said the gallant? His answer was, he would unto the stews, and from the commonest creature pluck a glove and wear it as a favor, and with that, <laughs> he would unhorse the lustiest challenger. As dissolute as desperate. Yet, though both, I see some sparks of better hope, which elder years may haply bring forth. But who comes here? Enter Duke of Omol, amazed. Where is the king? What means our cousin that he stares and looks so wildly? God save your grace. I do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace alone. Uh, withdraw yourselves uh, and leave us here alone. Exit all but King Henry and Omerl. What is the matter with our cousin now? Omerl kneels before the king. Forever may my knees grow to the earth. My tongue cleave to my roof within my mouth, unless a pardon ere I rise or speak. Intended or committed was this fault. If on the first, how heinous ere it be. To win thy after love, I pardon thee. Omel rises. Then give me leave that I may turn the key, that no man enter till my tale be done. Have thy desire. Omer locks the door. My liege, beware! Look to thyself! Thou hast a traitor in thy presence there! Villain, I'll make thee safe! Stay thy revengeful hand, thou hast no cause to fear! Open the door, secure, foolhardy king! Shall I for love speak treason to thy face? Open the door, I will break it open! King Henry unlocks the door, and the Duke of York enters. What is the matter, uncle? Speak. Recover breath. Tell us how near is danger that we may arm us, arm to encounter it. Peruse this writing here, and thou shalt know the treason that my haste forbids me show. Remember, as thou reads, thou promise fast. I do repent me. Read not my name there. My heart is no confederate with my hand. It was, villain. Ere thy hand did set it down, I tore it from the traitor's bosom, king. Fear and not love begets his penitence. Forget to pity him, lest thy pity prove a serpent that will sting thee to thy heart. Heinous, <clears throat> strong, and bold conspiracy. 
O oh, loyal father and treacherous son, thou sheer immaculate and silvery fountain from whence this stream of through muddy passengers hath held his current and defiled himself. Thy overflow of good converts to bad and thy abundant goodness shall excuse this deadly blot in thy disgusting son. So shall my virtue be his vices board and he shall spend mine honor with his shame as thriftless sons their scraping father's gold. Mine honor lives when his dishonor dies, or my shamed life in his dishonor lies. Thou killst me in his life, giving him breath, the traitor lives, the true man's put to death. Oh, what hell? My liege, for God's sake, let me in. What shrill voiced suppliant makes her see this eager cry? A woman and thy aunt, great king, tis I. Oh, speak with me, pity me, open the door. A beggar begs that never begged before. Oh, our scene is altered from a serious thing and now changed to the beggar and the king. My dangerous cousin, let your mother in. I know she's come to pray for your foul sin. Oh, Merle opens the door. If thou do pardon whosoever pray, more sins for this forgiveness prosper may. This festered joint cut off, the rest rest sound. This, let alone, will all the rest confound. Enter Duchess of York. O oh, King, believe not this hard-hearted man. Love loving not itself, none other can. Thou frantic woman, what dost thou make here? Shall thy old dugs once more a traitor rear? Sweet York, be patient. Hear me, gentle liege. Rise up, good aunt. Uh, not yet. I thee beseech. Forever I will walk upon my knees and never see day that the happy sees till thou give joy, until thou bid me joy by pardoning Rutland, my transgressing boy. Unto my mother's prayers I bend my knee. Against them both my true joints bended be. I'll ill mayest thou thrive if thou grant any grace. Oh, pleads he in earnest. Hmm? Look upon his face. His eyes do drop no tears. His prayers are in jest. His words come from his mouth, ours from our breast. He prays but faintly and would be denied. We pray with heart and soul and all beside. His weary joints would gladly rise, I know. Arnie shall kneel till the ground they grow. His prayers are full of false hypocrisy, ours of true zeal and deep integrity. Our prayers do outpray his. Then let them have that mercy which true prayer ought to have. Good aunt, stand up. Nay, do not say stand up. Say pardon first and afterwards stand up. And if I were thy nurse, thy tongue to teach pardon would be the first word of thy speech. I never longed to hear a word till now. Oh, say pardon, king. Let pity teach thee how. The word is short, but not so short as sweet. No word like pardon for king's mouth to so meet. Speak it in French, king. Say pardon à moi. Dost thou teach pardon to destroy? Her, oh, my sour husband, my hard-hearted lord, that sets the world itself against the word? Speak pardon, as tis current in our land, the chopping French we, we do not understand. Thine eye begins to speak, set thy tongue there. Oh, in thy piteous heart plant thou thine ear, that hearing how our plaints and prayers do pierce, pity may move thee, pardon to rehearse. Good aunt, stand up. I do not sue to stand. Pardon is all the suit I have in hand. I pardon him, as God shall pardon me. 
Oh, happy vantage of a kneeling knee. Yet I am sick for fear. Speak it again. Joy saying pardon doth not pardon twain, but makes one pardon strong. <laughs> With all my heart, I pardon you. Oh, God on earth thou art. But for they our, all stand. But for our trusty brother-in-law, and the abbot, with all the rest of the consorted crew, destruction straight shall dog them at the heels. Good uncle, help to order several powers to Oxford, or wherever these traitors are. They shall not live within this world, I swear, but I will have them if I once know where. Uncle, farewell. And cousin, adieu. Your mother well hath prayed and proved you true. Come, my old son, I pray God make thee new. They all exit. Act five, scene four, a royal palace. Enter Sir Exton and servant. Didst thou not mark the king what words he spake? Have I no friend will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? These were his very words. Have I no friend, quoth he. He spake it twice, and urged it twice together, did he not? He did. <laughs> and speaking it, he wistly looked on me, and who should say, I would thou wert the man that would divorce this terror from my heart? Meaning the king of Pompey, uh, come, let's go. I am the king's friend, and I will rid his foe. They exit. Act five, scene five. Pomfret Castle. Enter King Richard alone. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. And for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts. And these same thoughts people this little world. In humours like the people of this world. For no thought is contented. The better sort, as thoughts of things divine, are intermixed with scruples. And so do set the word itself against the word as thus. Come, little ones, and then again, it is, it is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a small needle's eye. Thoughts tending to ambition, they do plot unlikely wonders. How these vain, weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world my ragged prison walls. And for they cannot die in their own pride. Thoughts tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune's slaves, nor shall not be the last. Like silly beggars who, sitting in the stocks, refuge their shame that many have and others must sit there. And in this thought, they find a kind of ease, bearing their own misfortunes on the back of such as have before endured the like. Thus play I in one person, many people, and none contented. Sometimes am I a king? then treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then am I kinged again. 
and by and by, I think that I am unkinged by Bullingbrook and straight am nothing. But whate'er I be, nor I, nor any man, that but man is with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. Music do I hear? Ah, ah, keep time. How sour sweet music is when time is broken, no proportion kept. So it is in the music of men's lives. And here have I the daintiness of ear to check time broke in a disordered string. But for the concord of my state and time, had not an ear to hear my true time broke. I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. For now hath time made me his numbering clock. My thoughts are minutes, and with sighs they jar their watchers on unto mine eyes the outward watch whereto my finger like a dial's point is pointing still in cleansing them from tears. Now, sir, the sound that tells what hour it is are clamorous groans which strike upon my heart, which is the bell. So sighs and tears and groans show minutes, times and hours. But my time runs posting on in Bullingbrook's proud joy while I stand fooling here his jack of the clock. This music mads me, let it sound no more. For though it hath holp madmen to their wits in me, it seems it will make wise men mad. <sighs> Yet blessing on his heart that gives it me, for tis a sign of love. And love to Richard is a strange brooch in this all-hating world. Enter a groom of the stable. Hail, royal prince. Thanks, noble peer. The cheapest of us is ten groats too dear. What art thou, and how comes thou hither, where no man never comes but that sad dog that brings me food? to make misfortune live. I was a poor groom of thy stable, king, when thou wert king, who, travelling towards York with much ado, at length have gotten leave to look upon my sometimes royal master's face. Oh, how it yearned my heart when I beheld in London streets of that coronation day, when Bolingbroke rode on Rowan Barbary, that horse that thou so often have bestreed, that horse that I so curve carefully have dressed. Rode he on Barbary? <laughs> Tell me, gentle friend, how went he under him? So proudly as if he disdained the ground. So proud that Bullingbrook was on his back. That jade hath eat bread from my royal hand. This hand hath made him proud with clapping him. Would he not stumble? Would he not fall down, since pride must have a fall, and break the neck of that proud man that did usurp his back? Forgiveness, horse. Why do I rail on thee, since thou, created to be awed by man, wast born to bear? I was not made a horse, and yet I bear a burthen like an ass, spurred, galled, and tired by jauncing Bullingbrook. Enter a keeper with a meal. Fellow, give place. Here is no longer stay. If thou love me, tis time thou wert away. What my tongue dares not, that my heart shall say. The groom exits. My lord, will it please you to fall to? Taste of it first, as thou art wont to do. My lord, I dare not. 
Sir Piers of Exton, who lately came from the king, commands the contrary. The devil take Henry of Lancaster and thee. Patience is stale, and I am weary of it. Richard beats the keeper. Help! 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 Enter Exton and servants, armed. How now? What means death in this rude assault? Villain, thy own hand yields thy death's instrument. He snatches a weapon from a servant and kills him with it. Go thou, and fill another room in hell. He kills another servant before Exton strikes him down. That hand shall burn in never-quenching fire that staggers thus my person. Exton! Thy fierce hand hath with the king's blood stained the king's own land. Mount, mount my soul. Thy seat is up on high, whilst my gross flesh sinks downward, here to die. King Richard dies. As full of valour as of royal blood, both I have spilled. Oh, would the deed were good. <laughs> For now the devil that told me I did well says that this deed is chronicled in hell. This dead king to the living king I'll bear. Take hence the rest and give them burial here. They all exit. Act 5, Scene 6, Windsor Castle. Enter King Henry IV, Duke of York, with lords and attendants. My noble York, the latest news we hear is that the rebels have consumed with fire our town of Chichester and Gloucestershire, but whether they are taken or slain, we hear not. Ah, welcome, my lord. What news? First, to thy sacred state wish I all happiness. The next news is, I have to London sent the heads of Oxford, Salisbury, Blunt, and Kent. The manner of their taking may appear at large discoursed in this paper here. We thank thee, gentle Percy, for thy pains, and to thy worth will add right worthy gains. Ah, Lord Fitzwater. My lord, I have from Oxford sent to London the heads of Brocus and Sir Bennet Seeley, two of the dangerous consorted traitors that sought at Oxford thy dire overthrow. Thy pains, Fitzwater, shall not be forgot. Right noble is thy merit, well I wot. The grand conspirator, abbot of Westminster, with clog of conscience and sour melancholy, hath yielded up his body to the grave. But here is Carlisle living to abide thy kingly doom and sentence of his pride. Carlisle. This is thy doom. Choose out some secret place, some reverend room, more than thou hast, and with it, joy thy life. So as thou livest in peace, die free from strife. For though mine enemy thou hast ever been, high sparks of honor in thee I have seen. Great King, within this coffin I present thy buried fear. Herein all breathless lies the mightiest of the greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, by me hither bought. Exton, I thank thee not, for thou hast wrought a deed of slander with thy fatal hand upon my head and all this famous land. From your own mouth. My lord, did I this deed? I love not poison that do poison need, nor do I thee. Though I did wish him dead, I hate the murderer, love him murdered. 
the guilt of conscience, take thou from thy labor, by neither my good word nor my princely favor, with Cain go wander through shades of night, and never show thy head by day nor light. Lord, oh, I protest my soul is full of woe, that blood should sprinkle me to make me grow. Oh, come, mourn with me for what I do lament, and put on sullen black liniment. I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land to wash this blood from off my guilty hand. March sadly after, grace my mornings here in weeping after this untimely beer. Exit all. The end of The Life and Death of Richard II by William Shakespeare. Hello and goodbye. That is the end of the show. We will see you when I'm going to get the details up right now on May 11th, 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time for Henry IV, Part 1, the continuation of this story in which Henry is beset with all kinds of woes, namely from his son, Hal, the future Henry V. We will see you then. Hope you enjoyed it, and bye-bye. Veni, creator spirit.